All right, well, welcome back to the Man Cave Classroom. Uh, again, continuing with our theme of talking about missing sports. All right, we figured we'd suit up. Um, at least uh, Mr. Kogan has a, uh, a guy on the Mets that actually lasted more than one season. I had a guy who was a one-season wonder, Randy Johnson, but he did do... My childhood idol, uh, Gary Carter. He did do good Geico commercials with the snowball fight. Yes, he did. He That's did. it, yeah. but they don't remember that. <laughs> All right, so we're continuing along in the 20s. We now have Coolidge as, as president. We're keeping it cool with... Pre uh, with we are keeping it cool with Coolidge as president. So today we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of some of this economic prosperity. Um, did you want to bring in that, uh, you know, people having more time to do things? Oh, yeah. yeah so so we're, this is great. we're coming out of the Industrial Revolution. We're coming out of the rise of labor unions. Labor unions fought for and won a shorter work day. They won more pay for, for that less work. They won weekends off. So the average American is working 40 hours a week, only eight hours a day, five days a week. That gives you 16 hours a day where you're not working. That's a pretty good math right there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Don't, I, I had to memorize that. Uh, <laughs> so, so they're working less, they have more time for entertainment, more downtime for things that they're going to do, which is a huge part of the Roaring Twenties and how people are going to be spending their money. So family's gonna have more quality time to spend together. Now, the one thing that I could think of, when we look at living rooms today, um, we often see that you know you have couches and everything, but everything is focusing in on the TV, right? But you didn't have that during the 20s. You had the radio. Now, people, you know, when we're teaching middle schoolers about the radio and people being focused around the radio and listening to the radio, it kind of seems a little silly at first. However, if you didn't see it this year, don't worry. I'm sure they'll play it for 24 hours next year, right? If you're if you've ever seen a Christmas story. You kind of see that child's enthusiasm for the radio. Now, with this scene, he was listening to Little Orphan Annie. Um, then, of course, there was a decoder, and of course, uh, the when he wanted his Ovaltine. Yeah, right? it was an action so advertisement. So you needed you needed Ovaltine Drink as your Ovaltine. advertisers. Very similar to uh, advertising, uh, really being the driving force behind programs. So here he is in the bathroom. Uh, with a secret decoder ring, and it was a message: Don't forget to drink your Ovaltine. Now, just in a little even innocent scene right here. You know, here they are Christmas morning. You know, Christmas tree right here. Couches were over here, if I can remember. And bang, there's the radio. And it was huge. Huge. Huge radio. Huge. My great grandfather, uh, he he actually used to build those. That's really? that's all I got. Your great grandfather hurt Coolidge. Uh, <laughs> my great grandfather was making radios. I like your story better because that that's all I can say. Yeah. Now the radios, of course, varied in size. And again, you see them in the. Uh, you know, very similar to your TVs today. You can have a small one. You can have a huge screen TV. You and it was the focal point of your living room. You know, the family would sit there after dinner and listen to their shows. Similar to they have, like, podcasting. You know, just be able to go out and listen to somebody talk. Or in this case, there were actors, you know, putting on entire shows. My dad grew up watching, uh, listening to The Shadow. You know, like the first superhero program on radio. He's always told me about it. Um, and since we're wearing baseball jerseys, this was how, yeah. you, this was how you listened to sports. And the sports broadcast, and I'm sure we'll get into this later on with uh, when it comes to the radio, the, the announcers, I mean, you, it, it really became an art form because people are at home listening to this, and they really had to paint a real, uh, you know, a clear picture as to what was in front of them. The pitcher winds up. He takes the pitch. You know, the wide quarterback comes to the line. There's two wideouts to the left, one to the right. And even today with ESPN, when they're doing – a, uh, a game review or a game summary of a highlight, you know, sometimes they'll take that audio from that particular radio and kind of plug it in there mm -hmm. because the enthusiasm with that broadcaster, you can really sense it and feel it because he really needs to kind of sell it to the viewer. So again, radio being the center, again, they varied in sizes. Now, when we get to the vacuum, uh, it's, funny, it's kind of funny. I was looking last night. I'm like, what are we going to be talking about tomorrow? All right, radios, that's cool. Oh, vacuums. Oh, vacuums, that's cool. And then I got, went around running in my house. I'm like, all right, cool. We're talking about vacuums. Now, this is not from the 20s. However, I, I know we love to analyze documents in social studies, but when it comes to analyzing an artifact or something from the past, uh, I can tell you, and again, I'm not a vacuum enthusiast, so I'm not going to be... I'm not even going to pretend to be an expert, but just looking at this, I started off with some basics. Okay, well, when it came to this, I looked at it, I was able to find a date. 
And if we had enough money in our budget, our cameraman would focus in on the date, <laughs> which would show you that it's 1911. All right, so how does this vacuum then operate? Apparently, it stored some dirt probably right down there. There was little knobs here that I was able to untwist, but it would really require some force to get it open. So I'm sure that's where the dirt was. Um, the way this would operate as well, um, now it's 1911, 1920, so you're going to see probably why there was a transition. You're vacuuming this, and now you have to pull this back. So now you feel like you're literally starting up a lawnmower while you're vacuuming your entire floor. Um, some other features that I was just looking at when it came to trying to figure out something about this. All right, this happened to be made in um, Chicago. Um, the name of the company as well. Um, apparently, these were very short-lived. However, you know, you can get them on eBay. But again, you can see probably why they were short-lived. Somebody just said, hey, this is just too... Too, too much, much work. Too much work. Too much work. I was clearly I was not man enough to vacuum during this particular time period. So so we, we now look at this particular advertisement for a vacuum and, and what's one of the first things that jump out of us? It's electric. Gone are the days of having to clean your house by literally pulling on this plunger thing to suck the dirt in. Now you just have to flip a switch to vacuum and clean your home. Now the interesting thing with the advertising here is that you know they give you reasons. Right, they give you actual steps, and if you look at the, the advertising between 2020 to today, um, it, it's almost like we, we're we're more fixated on the bigger words. Yeah. It seems like today, or or prices where you know they were really trying to hammer you with some details here. Another one, Eureka vacuum cleaner. Yeah, what you, what jumps out at me here, Mister Heath, yeah. very top, a magnificent gift to the women of America. Now we don't write this, folks. We just teach it. Yeah, okay, that's it. You know, we, we have to put ourselves in the context of the 1920s, where the women of the time, although they have the right to vote now, are still viewed, in the most part, as second-class citizens. Their view of, of, of women, hey, your job is the role in the home, and they're focusing advertisement on this. If this advertisement came out today, this company would have to issue apologies left and right Absolutely. because they're, they're, they're in the wrong, 100% in the wrong. But when we go back to the context of the time, it was perfectly acceptable then. And this was your target audience. Yeah. So, I mean, probably, I mean, aside from the fact that, you know, hey, this is, this is unfair, you know, when you start to look at how advertising starts to change as well, um, when we look at advertising, it starts to expand where you see the target audience is more focused on, I guess you could say families or more individuals, not necessarily gender specific. Now for a company, that means bigger audience, bigger profits as well. But you know, again, for the 20s, uh, even earlier than that, if you're looking at advertisements when it comes to household products such as vacuums or refrigerators, you're gonna see that target audience is going to be women. Anything else we wanna do with this? No. Eight, eight, well, 850, wow, if only, right? Yeah. Attachments. $28. You can't even get hand sanitizer for $28, <laughs> right? Toilet so, paper. Um, and again, the big thing sticking out here, of course, is that this is electric. Again, we're starting to make that transition. Yeah, it's making your life easier, easier for cleaning your home. You have more time. Now, the refrigerators, these I love. These are really cool. Um, wish I could have one, uh, you know, considering just the material. Because with the material I'm thinking here, what are they? Mostly cast his, iron, yeah, cast iron or a type of like maybe marble, like those tubs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm um, going and looking at this. I mean, again, here we go electric. Um, because something we caught this one right here, yeah, there we go. You this, know, prior to the electric refrigerator, you know, there was an ice man who came to your house once a week with a giant block of ice, and you would put it in the top of what was called your ice box and go with the science, you know, cold air drops down, it would keep your stuff cold. And if you wanted ice, you'd have to chip it off with an ice pick. But once the ice ran out, you were out of luck. <laughs> Whatever food was in there might spoil. Now, plug it in, you're, you're good. It says, it says here, I think it says the, the modern ice man yep. ca calls once, but with a frigid air, the ice is always frozen. Perfect. You know, it's exactly what you needed at the time. So let's go back here. Uh, again, we're seeing electric, right? Familiar company, still around today. General Electric, right? Wonderful. Um, things you could put in there. Looks like right up here, this is where you're going to put your ice. Yep. All right. Anything you we want. Your bread, milk, cheese. Perfect. And again, here's where this advertisement would be appearing. Saturday Evening Post. Um, very popular was a magazine, right? A lot of mm -hmm. Norman Rockwell paintings wind up in there. And again, you see it here, the target audience. Go back to the next one. Yep. 
you know, our nope, target listen. audience again are women. You know, because again, that role of women in America at the time, that 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 cook clean care mentality of they're the ones who are going to be dealing with kitchen life. Even again here. Yep, same here. I love this one. This one's like really nice. Yeah, yeah even now. So we're going from the kitchen, now we're going to how you're gonna get to work. All right, and something that we talked about in previous units. Um, we are talking about the role of the automobile. Now with the role of the automobile, we talked about Henry Ford and the Model T. And you can get the first Model T in any color you want as long as it was black. Um, this, right, we're looking here, $650. Woo! You can't even get tires for that anymore. Nope. Well, you can't, well, no, you can't. Yeah, I just changed my wife tires the other day, $1,000. Four tires. Which will be the price of toilet paper next week. Yep. All right, buy it because it's a better car. Again, we're looking more at this. Now, even though we don't have people in here, um, to kind of demonstrate how the car is used and how happy they are with it. I mean, who do you think the possible target audience could be for this one? I mean, four or five passengers, it looks Definitely like. Definitely a family. Definitely a family. Looking Absolutely. Looking at a family. Yep. Oof. 750. 850. 19 years, making it, all right, great. And again, target audience here, I mean, you don't see the people in here, but it's probably implied that, you know, if you're looking at it, um, this is a family. Probably very similar to your minivans of today, yeah. if those are still cool. And again, when we look here, how are these automobiles being made? Well, we go back to previous units, they're being made on the assembly line. All right, assembly line, these things are being mass produced. How does, the, what kind of impact does that have? You don't have to pay your workers as much. You can produce a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand a day versus having one person build a car, which is going to take you weeks on an end. You don't have to pay your workers as much because they're in the same yeah. position. The cost then of the product goes, goes down. down. And you can sell even more. Anything else I want to include? From, uh, there's something else I'm thinking when it comes to mass production. Safer, easier, faster, cheaper. Yeah, and that, that was the thing. Because yeah. the, when you start to see, when we, when we go back to Westwood Expansion, we're talking about uh, the railroads. You, you see those common words come up. Faster, easier, cheaper, more efficient. We saw that with the railroads. We saw that with the Bessemer process. We're seeing that with cars. You know, the whole idea, and when we're getting into consumerism in the 1920s, this is what people want. They want things fast, they want it easy, they want it cheaper, and that's that's the way we start to move. So, I mean, back to the, our, our vacuum cleaner for a second, go back to what we were talking about at the beginning. People have more money. You know, and even that car, 650 bucks, who's got that money on hand to pay for things right now? If we notice up here at the top left, you know, $2 down and $3 a month. What could that possibly mean? I, I don't know. What could it possibly mean? on how we're going to be able to afford this new lifestyle that many Americans want to live. I mean, we just said they're only making about 1500 that chart said about $1,500 a year, which is, which is a great living for them, but people want to buy things and they don't always have cash on hand. Right now, I have a whopping 20, 40, I have a whole whopping $46 on me. Somebody got their allowance this Yes, week. they did. I did not. They did. 46 bucks. But there's something in there that can help you out because if you go home and, and, and you know your wife calls you and says the vacuum's broke, you don't have enough money for a vacuum. I mean, how can you pay for that if you don't have enough Oh, cash? you know, yeah. What do I got? Oh, here we go. I got a credit card. There we go. So we're going to start to see the the earliest phases of buying on credit known as installment buying. You can walk into a store, give them your name, give them your, there was a bunch of- uh, uh, All the other criteria. Yeah, yeah, criteria verifications. And then they would give you a product that might cost $500 on the spot. And then over the course of the next several months, you're paying back that product as an installment uh, payment. Plus a little thing called interest. You know, because a bank, Bank of America here, they have to have an incentive to, uh, to give me the money to purchase the vacuum that just broke. Now, the thing is, is that, I mean, banks and uh, American society, they've, they've been using credit probably for, for years up until this point. But in the 1920s, I, I, I wouldn't say you see it used. You see it almost, for example, abused. And you get to see how dangerous it is. When Mr. Kogan and I went to college, you know, a long time ago, I don't know about you, um, but anytime I was coming out of class, there'd be a desk set up and you could sign up to get an American Express card. Yeah, you could. And you're going to give me, a 20-year-old, an American Express card? That was probably one of the dumbest things. Now, here's something else that they did to make me stop, right? I don't know if your college did it or mine. But you know what they would put at that desk to make me stop and listen to them to sign up to get that free T-shirt? They put a pretty girl right there. 
worked every time. Hey, can I talk to you about signing up for a yeah, credit card? Oh, uh, yes, pretty girl. I don't know what it is that you want to talk to me about, but pretty girls don't talk to me, so what do I have to fill out? Oh, and you give me a t-shirt. Now, most college students, like ourselves, you, know, you really don't have a lot of money. So you get the credit card and you go, hey, guess what? I'm only going to use this for an emergency. Then, all of a sudden, your definition of emergency kind of starts to get redefined. Books, car stuff, all that wonderful stuff. But then all of a sudden, hey, the Knicks made the playoffs. That's an emergency because they don't make the playoffs that often. So I'm going to get some tickets. And you start to see how that snowball effect or avalanche can wind up leading to a lot of credit problems. A lot, a lot of potential problems, like foreshadowing for you. Yeah. 1920s, installment buying, right. people are buying things they can't necessarily afford because it was easy i could walk into a store right now and walk out of here with a 90 inch flat screen tv and look at or, the advertising i mean i need this yeah. apparently if you're looking at this advertisement i need it look i need this. i don't want to sit there with the vacuum no, anymore gosh, I, no. I need it i can get hurt people are spending money they don't necessarily have foreshadowing what happens at the end of the decade stock market's gonna crash People, these banks are going to be like, hey, you need to pay us the money that we lent you in installment buying. Oh, gosh, I don't have the money to pay you. Great Depression. That whole buy now, pay later, I yep. mean, it really is, I mean, if, unless you have that whole concept of what really that looks like, um, you know, it's very dangerous. So for installment buying, we're buying on credit. Buyers can take a new home, uh, take home a new refrigerator by putting down just a few dollars. Each month they paid an installment until they had to pay for it, um, plus interest. Um, buy now, pay later. This is going to increase the demand for goods. So if the demand is high, right, they're going to start keep pumping them up, all right, because people are going to start to buy them. Um, I'm trying to think. Was that, I, I think That's pretty much there's it another point I think I wanted to make over the refrigerator. I'm trying to remember because the interesting thing. I mean, when you look at the refrigerator today, um, and it's kind of interesting because the the electric ones that we have today, um, it's almost like they're not as reliable as, as the. I mean, my one that's over there in the corner. That's from the 70s or <laughs> 80s. And this thing has survived longer than the refrigerator up there. Definitely so, reliable. Absolutely. So we Don't know about efficiency, but definitely reliable. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when you're looking at, at certain households, even today with refrigerators, uh, you probably need either at least one or two. So, you know, again, some of these things become not only just wants, but, but necessities as, as we start to see society change. I'm good. Yeah, we're good. All right. We'll see you guys in a couple minutes. Later.